And today we're very lucky to have a conversation with one of the leading public clock experts, Keith Scobie Youngs, who's a co-founder of the Cumbria Clock Company up in the north of England in the Lake District. So hopefully he can hear me. Hello, Keith. Hi. Hello, Catherine. Hello, Keith. Thank you um, for waiting patiently there and welcome to our chat. Um, Keith, before we do talk about the clock and go into detail, I just wanted to ask you, how did you become a clockmaker? What inspired you? Well, um, you'll see in the next slide, Catherine, that uh, I was very lucky. I was at the age of 14. I wanted to be a clockmaker. And this is a photograph of me in my early 20s looking mm -hmm. very young, I must say. Um, and so I, I was very lucky. My father was head of woodwork, metalwork and technical drawing at the local comprehensive school. And we always thought, if, he always said, if you had, can work with your hands, you'll always have a job. So I decided to become a clockmaker, got a book out of the local library, made book bits in his workshop. And then I went to Birmingham Polytechnic for three years, where they had a uh, horology, the science of measurement of time. And this course is still run by BCU now at the School of Silversmithing and Jewelry. And my youngest son, Callum, is still there now. Um, I left Birmingham uh, in 1981 and moved to London and I was hoping to get a job doing domestic clocks etc etc but um, I couldn't find a job and somebody offered me one doing church and public clocks and I thought well I'll do that until a proper job came along but I fell in love with it Catherine going to these wonderful buildings seeing uh, wonderful huge turret clocks and it combines so many different skills and I was really fortunate that I happened to work with two men who are ex Thwaites and Reed, who had been involved with Big Ben for many years previously. And Vic Adams had been a service manager and John Vernon, uh, who I improved with, as they called it then. He was the man who saved the clock in 1976. So I was very fortunate. I, he used to tell me the stories, but I never thought I'd ever be in a position to work on the clock myself. So. That, that's quite nice. You could say he inspired you, John Vernon. Um, thank, you. thank you for that, Keith. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the Cumbria Clock Company? How was that established? I was very lucky, Catherine, and if you see the next slide, um, we, we have these wonderful workshops in the Valley of Dacre. I was lucky because I met my wife, Lynn, in London, and she said, well, look, let's go and set up our own business. I would never have done it on my own. So 32 years ago, off we went to the Lake Dips. And we now have 5,000 square feet of workshop down in this valley behind a medieval castle, a mile and a half by it from Lake Oldswater. And in those workshops, they're fully equipped so that we can undertake all the work necessary for the conservation and restoration of church and public clocks. And we now employ 22 people. We have regional engineers. We look after over a thousand clocks throughout the UK and we also work worldwide all the way to Fiji. So it's it's a nice story for a firm up in Cumbria. Yeah, it looks absolutely stunning, that photograph. Um, so the big, the big Ben project must have been the most challenging to date, would you say? It is. It's a it's a it is a it is a challenge. We first got involved with um, the, the great clock at Westminster when the Palace team were undertaking some work in 2007 and they we made the temporary synchronous electric drive that you can see above the mechanism there. Um, the Palace clock team were undertaking major repair works to the strike train and the going train at that time and so this unit was used to drive the four dials during that 12 week period. I was a little bit nervous watching news at 10. I was a bit concerned if it was moved news at 10 to 10 or 10 past 10. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think our connection with that back in 2007, uh, it, 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 that's how we became considered for this wonderful project uh, of the, the whole conservation of the, the turret clock, the great clock. Well, if you're on news at 10 now, it's all for good reasons. So, um, Keith, where did you start? Where did you start? Well, in the next slide, you can see um, that there, there's, there's, there's major components. Up in the top left is the photograph of the clock movement as similar to yours. It's 11 and a half tonnes 
of turret clock. And, but it's a precision instrument and must be treated as such. It's like you wouldn't take the back off your wristwatch and put it on the kitchen table while you're doing the decorating. And because there were major works going on in the tower, the clock mechanism had to come out. And so working with the palace clock team, we had to dismantle the whole of that clock mechanism. Also the dial motion works, which you can see in the right hand picture, the gearing which give the 12 to one reduction between the minute and the hour hand, that had to be removed. And also in the bottom left, all the hammers, uh, not only on Big Ben itself, but all the quarter hammers, because there were major works going on in the belfry. And even though these things are big and heavy, you just don't want that ingress of grit and dust, cause, which will cause, if left, a huge amount of wear. So everything had to come out. So where what we did, the, what the first thing we had to do was to remove the, the hands. And so we had a wonderful scaffold made because we weren't quite sure exactly how much the hands were going to weigh. And we made a, a puller to, to pull the hands off their splines because th th they were tight. This wasn't because of rust or corrosion. This was because Dent had made the, 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 the everything so well fitting that it just needed to be pulled off. So once we got the hands off the shafts, they could be taken around the tower and put into the um, goods lift and taken down uh, to ground level. And then we could start to, to work on the inside. Is that the first time that the hands have come off the, metal, off the clock faces? Well, no, dials, I think I say dials. They've, they've, come, they've come off the dials. So they, back in the 1980s, they came off and we've got several photographs of men with flat caps and moustaches <laughs> working <laughs> dial in, in the 30s and 40s. So they have come off, but that, that tightness was literally down to good machining. And here we have a great photograph of Ian and Hugh of the Palace Clock team, yes. both yes. smiling away. And, and we're here removing the, the minute rod. And this is the, the shaft which holds the minute hand. It's over two meters long. It's approaching 100 millimeters in diameter and weighs in excess of 70 kilos. So we had to remove that and then start to remove the rest of the dial motion works and all the, um, of all four dials, uh, which, which was a considerable amount of weight. But once we got those off, we had to then start about thinking about dismantling the clock movement. And before we can start to dismantle the clock movement, we had to lower the weights. And these are the three weights hanging in the weight shaft, the ones you described earlier, Catherine. Yes. The, the one nearest to us is the quarter weight, which is weighing in at a tonne and a quarter. Then you've got the going train weight, which is a quarter of a tonne, and the one at the back, which is one tonne. To give you an idea of the size of these weights, the pulleys that you see are over a metre in diameter. So they're huge weights. This is a really interesting photograph because they've taken the, all the sandbags out of the tower. And so we'd be able to bring them down to a low level so we could take them away, uh, mainly so that people could work in there, but also so we could, we could clean those as well. So once we had the, the weights down, we could start to think about the clock mechanism itself. And here you go. Uh, you know how small that clock room is. <laughs> yes. uh, so we, we kind of took all the small components away and took those down, but the larger components we had to store to one side. And then that meant we could start to consider dismantling the, the three heavy barrels which sit onto the clock frame. And if you go to the next slide, you can see on the left hand side us removing the quarter uh, chime barrel. Uh, this weighs 760 kilos. I think it's the heaviest uh, component in horology in the UK, if not the world. And so we had to lift that out carefully and put it onto a, a special stand so that we could dismantle it up in the clock tower because we won't be able to get it down in one piece. The other photograph is the pendulum bob. And again, this is this is quite a weight. This weighs 160 kilos. 
it's nearly four meters long or over four meters long and we had to lift it out of the pendulum pit and lift it over the clock frame so we could again could dismantle that so we could lower it all down and i personally don't think um, that this pendulum has ever been removed from its pit since it was put in in 1859 so once we got all these heavy components out the job was to start to lower them down the tower so i think if we look and here we go the quickest and most direct way was the way that they most likely brought the parts up and that's straight down the weight shaft below the clock mechanism so we had to really lift up all the grills and the grates and then set up a winch above the aperture in the middle of the, the, the clock frame and then start to lower everything about 220 feet straight down the weight shaft. And this is obviously a nice photograph of the heavy barrels going down there. But we took all the wheel trays, everything down there, and it took us about three days to get everything down to the bottom and ready to, to take off site. Did you use the double crab that was designed by Denison, the double barreled crab? Yeah, it's a lovely crab that which sits, it's a winch which sits up <laughs> above by the bevel gears. Unfortunately not, Catherine, I think the um, <laughs> health and executive wouldn't be too happy for no, us to use that not. because it hadn't, hadn't been used for a long time. So we got everything out of the tower by then and it just left us with this clock frame. And um, this is a powerful image, isn't it, of the frame, you know, without the movement in there. And did you remove the frame, Keith? No, we didn't. Um, we considered it. We had a good chat with everybody at the Palace Clock team, everybody else. But the reason we decided to leave it when it did have that great breakdown in 1976 and John Vernon rebuilt and saved the clock, um, he put in a lot of auxiliary ironwork to support it where it broke the, 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 the right hand third off the clock frame. And so we decided that if we were going to take it out, we'd disturb all of that union. And we thought it was best just to leave it where it is, take off all the bolts, all the protruding fixings. And that meant that we could cover the clock frame and we can address that when we came back uh, on the reinstall. So Keith, the clock movement is out of the tower. How did you uh, keep one dial? showing the correct time how did you do it no movement how was that done well part of the contract was always to have one dial showing the correct time and to do that because we had to remove the whole clock mechanism uh, to do that we had to make a set of replica hands and a drive unit and here we are in our workshops manufacturing these hands the one thing that is a lot different with these than the original hands is that we had to fit the counterbalances within the tails of the hands. We couldn't use the counterbalances internally like the original clock did because they'd get in the way of all the work that's going on. So these hands are a lot heavier than the originals. But one thing we really wanted to do was to make sure that they looked like the original so people wouldn't be able to tell that there was a replica hands on there. And I think we achieved that, which is which is one of the main things we wanted to do. Yeah, I think you fooled me there because I couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> and then obviously with a set of hands, we had to design and make a drive unit. And this is the drive unit which yes. sits behind the dials. Now, this had to be made in such a way that it didn't alter or any of the original uh, 1859 uh, infrastructure. And this bracket is where the original set of um, motion works sit. And so we made our unit fit on top of there and so be clamped into position. So there's no cutting, no drilling. It had to be strong to take those um, heavy hands and it had to be powerful to make sure it kept the right time. Uh, we had to have a, a battery backup system. So should the power failure happen, the clock was going to keep going to time because this is definitely not a weight driven clock. Um, so we made two of those. And then the next photo, you can see this. I love this photograph and I, yes. I, I do use it a lot. It's the old dial design on the left, the new dial design on the right. 
um, which looks spectacular. And I think not only me, but the people who did the dials, the gilding, the stonework, you know, it's it's everybody's workmanship on show there, you know, as long as we're the, with the main contractors. But also I like this uh, photograph because it's got both sets of Cumbria Clock Company hands on, which makes us feel really proud. And this photograph could only be taken, it was a, in a time scale of about two days because they exposed the new blue dial and covered up the old dial. So it was a small snap in time. One photograph, which I don't think will ever be replicated again. Yeah, no, it's absolutely stunning. The new dolls are beautiful. So yeah. moving on, Keith, um, is this the Tolling unit? This is, along with making sure that one dial showed the right time, we had to make sure that uh, we could strike out for those real important uh, days and those being Remembrance Sundays and Remembrance Day and also for New, for new Year. And those are the occasions the Great Bell, uh, Big Ben did sound out. And we, we designed this tolling unit so that it gave exactly the same amount of lift as the clock movement does itself. It's electrically driven and the gaps are controlled by uh, one of our master clocks. I recognise the area. Will you keep that tolling unit in place for future yeah. use? Yeah, they've decided to keep it there. Um, it's put in a position where it doesn't interfere with um, the, the the great clock in the room below and if at any time in the future they need to use it for whatever occasion it's a relative straightforward uh, procedure to connect it all up. So Keith um, how did you set about so you have all the components up in Cumbria over a thousand of them how did you set about cleaning this really complex uh, mechanism and what methods did you use? Well, I mean, cleaning is the first thing you have to do. You've got yeah. this clock with, with decades of grime on it. I mean, the clock had never been out in its entirety ever before. So even though it's really well looked after by the, the, the clock team and the clock makers before them, we had to make sure that we got it all clean. So on the left, we're just using the standard kind of degreasing. We're using a citrus based cleaning fluid, which gets rid of all that heavy contaminated oil and grease. Um, in the bottom right, we're using a dry ice blaster, which is a, a new technique for cleaning where it fires um, dry ice at high pressure, causing thermal shocks onto uh, dirt and, and knocking it off that way. And then in the top right hand corner, you've got an aqua blast, which is little, almost like talcum powder size um, balls of glass cushioned in water, which just cleans off very, very gently any dirt that's hard to get into those little places. So we use three different methods of cleaning. Yeah, and I suppose you've got a much softer finish doing it that yeah. way. Yeah. And so then we started to look at the repair works. Now, the, I've, I've only given one example. We did many. These are the rollers which support the hour, uh, hour pipe on the dial motion works. and. They, they move very slowly, they're very awkward to service and several of them had very badly worn pivots and the bearings were very badly worn. So we had to address all of that to make sure that they supported the hour pipe uh, correctly. We had to do other, other works, we were working on the end of the minute shafts, making new rollers for the minute rod ends, uh, cutting a new pinion, cutting new bevels, but hopefully we'll be able to show those in a, in a later presentation. But uh, this is just a small example of what we did. Okay. This is just where we started to do the, the picture on the left hand side is just indicating how we painted all the objects. We tried to keep wherever we could the original paint underneath our new top coat. So if people were taking paint samples at a later date, they'll be able to find them. The teeth were clean to get rid of all that old uh, lubrication. We didn't want um, uh, that to become contaminated with the, with the new lubrication to be contaminated with the old. All the brass work was relacquered because there had been a lot of it had been damaged, some of it we had to machine. So to kind of give that uniformity, we repolished and uh, not repolished, finished and, and, and lacquered. One of these are is a set of photographs which were yeah. taken of the objects as they went through uh, the process of uh, conservation. So we got the rollers, the lifting levers, even the spanner with the with the with the nuts 
uh, for the minute hands at the bottom right hand corner. And if you show the next slide, Kathy, we even photographed the, the larger components going through the whole process. And this is one of the second arbors from the striking train, which has been at its finished state and photographed and, and measured. So I think you were mentioning in the in the next slide. These are the drawings. Yeah. I, I don't think there was any drawings made when the clock was constructed. I think Edmund Beckett Dennison, the man who designed the clock, Lord Grimthorpe, only made one set of drawings. Is yeah. that right, Keith? Well, we're not sure. I'm sure he had. I'm sure he had other drawings initially, but yeah. I know that when John Vernon um, was undertaking the work um, rebuilding the clock in 1976, he is quoted as saying the only drawing he had was the frontispiece in Watch Clocks and Bells, yes. Grimthorpe book on the subject. What we've gone ahead and done um, uh, as a, as the two teams discussing this was to produce a full set of engineering drawings for the whole clock mechanism. This will not only allow the palace clock team or, or, or people in the future should, to make a new component should it become damaged or worn, but it will also be able to put, become part of a manual so people will be able to understand the clock, know where it has to be lubricated, know what type of lubrication to be used and how regularly that can be have to be done. And also, if you go to the next slide, you start to see that we produce some renders so you get a better understanding of how the clock was constructed. And these will all come part of a, a wonderful um, operator's manual uh, so that people uh, we can just pass that knowledge from generation to generation. The Palace Clock team will now will be able to add notes to it and when they pass it on to the next generation, that knowledge will continue rather than being lost as unfortunately in a lot of cases like this, that knowledge does become lost on the way. And once we had all the um, all this work done, we started to uh, put the larger assemblies together. And here we have the dial motion works going together in the in the in the one of our workshops um, so that we can just check that all the bits that we've machined and that the, the, the odd new little bit that we made uh, fits perfectly. And once we got this motion work uh, together in the workshop, it gave us the opportunity as you'll see in the next slide, to test them. Um, so we, we built a, a big um, scaffold. These are big hands for a 23 and a, uh, 23 and a half foot down to dial, and it allowed us to construct the motion works on this test frame, fit the hands, and make sure that they rotated smoothly, that they're correctly balanced, and we weren't going to have any problems when we got to site. And it's a very useful process because it just made us realize exactly what was involved um, for putting them back together. And it was almost, you know, just gave us that confidence that when we went back to site, that we would be able to um, uh, put, it, put everything back and get everything running and know it's going to be fine. Yeah, thanks for that, Keith. Um, oh, I recognise this. This is the power assisted winding system that I spoke about earlier. And um, it looks yeah. a bit unreal seeing it there, actually, in its entirety. Because normally you only look at it yeah, from the front, don't you? Yeah, this is a wonderful thing. I mean, it is a it is a machine which is um, fitted so that it can wind the quarters, the going and the hour strike. And it's made in such a way that it can disconnect and connect, disengage and engage the winding motor uh, during the process of the clock striking and chiming. So as it came up to stand the quarters, it can disengage the winding mechanism, allow the clock to do the that quarter chime and then bring it back into engagement and start winding again. And it was a very clever uh, system indeed and it it was one of those machines which had um, kind of needed a bit of TLC and so but first there was no manual for this so first we had to in the next side you'll see we had to build a big jig to put it all together and power it up and understand how it worked 
and now we understand how it works um, it will be going back in and doing the job that it was designed. The clock has been with this automatic winding unit longer than it's been without it. That's what we've got to remember. And even it's so well designed, even in the going train, it's got this little epicyclic gearbox. So as it's winding the gear, the going train, maintaining power is in, uh, you know, uh, put through to the train. Yes. And then we had all the hammers to do. These, this is that famous double quarter hammer on the fourth bell, so that they can play that bottom note of the court, Westminster quarters quickly. All the parts were uh, blasted, repainted, pivots redone, oiling system, hammerheads uh, reprofiled, and um, made to be uh, new again. And uh, I love this hammer. I think it's uh, it's a great little great thing. Looks like a drone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's kind of got that shape. <laughs> and then the next one, it shows the uh, the going train. We got the going train back together, and we we're able to put this on test in our workshops. And we had this running for nearly two years, and we were able to regulate it. We were able to understand the regulating, as described in Grimthorpe's book. We fitted one of our automatic winding units to it, as you can see with that sprocket. So we made sure that the clock was being kept going all that period of time. And it gave us a great insight to how well this was designed and the, you know, how good a timekeeper it is. Is that the dense weights there I can see on the girder? The yes, they are. Are they the, the original the, ones? They're the original regulating weights that oh. you put on. They were before the pennies came along, Catherine. I hope you're still keeping the pennies. I don't think I have any choice <laughs> but to. Yeah, they're just people love looking at the pennies on the pendulum and they're pre 1971 pennies. Everyone where 240 <laughs> would be an old pound. Not that I remember that. It's just someone told me. So the next one, the, the, the next one thing, if you see on the next slide, we had to pack everything away. As we know, there's over a thousand pieces. So it was important that everything was uh, carefully uh, boxed away, nicely labelled, so that when we got to site, we wouldn't be scratching around trying to find the parts that we needed. And this also meant that if you look at the next slide, um, the large quarter barrel also had to be mounted in such a way that it should be able to be transported uh, back to site. So um, all the con conservation work is now finished. And I suppose your next major challenge is getting all those pieces back into the tower and putting them together again. Where did you start there? Um, it, it was the first part was to um, get the hammers in. So if you go to the next stage, that's it. Um, all the hammers, as I've said already, had been restored. So it was a case of fitting all the hammers back into position making sure that they get, we could get the correct amount of lift, uh, fitting new rubber buffers. These didn't have check springs. Uh, Denison had designed them to have rubber buffers. Um, make sure all the adjusters, which allowed you to uh, bring, you know, work out exactly how far you needed the hammerhead away from the bell. We, we made sure they were all free running. And these are little things which over the series, over time, had become corroded and the, the clock making teams previous to the palace clock team now, Ian, Hugh and Alex, um, couldn't adjust them on them. They, they'd seized up solid, but now they'll be able to have that flexibility to make sure that the hammers strike the bells well and, and deliver the correct note at the correct volume. And here's the, the, the uh, clock frame uh, being prepared. Uh, once they had finished a majority of the dusty works in that part of the tower, we were able to start to prepare the, the, this massive flatbed. Interestingly, um, over the over the, 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 the decades, the, the, the oils used had affected the paint and the paint had soft almost like a putty. So the cleaning, we, we, we saved as much again of the original paintwork as we could, but it was incredible how much it came off. Uh, John and Rosie were up there for quite a while um, cleaning down and, and repainting, making sure all the um, 
uh, threaded holes were clear, making sure that the bearing surfaces were um, nice and clean, so we ensured that they would go down, down square. And uh, it, it, was, it was quite a long process. It does look beautiful when you go up there now. And it's nice to see a female member of the staff, a female clockmaker. Uh, well, we have many female members of staff, <laughs> but this is the one on site, yeah. yeah. And so we then started to uh, bring uh, the parts of the mechanism back. And, and this is uh, starting to install the bevel gears above the, above the clock mechanism. And also that uh, crab winch that uh, was used to bring mm -hmm. the parts up. Uh, this, we, we, this photograph just shows the level of protection that we, we had to do, uh, put around it to make sure that none of the lovely paintwork and lacquer work got damaged in the process. Um, and once we got these in, we could start to install the dial motion works. This is the next slide. And these are beautiful things. Um, the counterweights for the hour hand uh, are about 140 kilos, just to give you an idea. And the minute rod and hour pipe, as you can see, are beautifully machined. And that's why the hands fit so perfectly. And we had to make sure you have to make sure that you get the right hand on the right set of motion works in the right position otherwise you're in trouble and thankfully dent made sure that they were marked it's not absolutely clear but you you can find their marks and you can put them on so once we got the dial motion works in place we were able to start to fit the hands and this is us bringing the, the hands up through the uh, scaffolding using block and tackle but also a little bit of labor to to uh, guide them up through up through the scaffold and once we got all four sets of hands on I think next there's a, a photograph of uh, looking down on them looking for, with the team feeling very proud and and seeing how beautiful they look at they all they they're so precise with the the hands are so close to the dial they look like a watch dial a giant watch dial so once we um, had got the hands on, we started to bring the clock movement back. And this is the going train going back into position, back into its rightful place. We still fit it. We've got it running on one of our auto winders so that it can operate. They work in the weight shaft, but with our auto winder, it can operate in a, uh, a smaller area. But it was um, uh, it's it's up there. It's ticking away. Uh, back in its rightful place. And then we had to then start to bring up the larger components using the service lift inside the tower. Um, and this is the Palace Clock team, Alex, Hugh and Ian putting together that giant um, quarter barrel uh, in, the, in the clock room. The, the space is restricted, but there's just about enough space for us to be able to get it, uh, get it together. And here we are putting the strike barrel back in. This barrel weighs 620 kilos. Um, and again, this is the one which sounds uh, the Big Ben or lifts the Big Ben hammer to sound Big Ben itself. And then, and here we are lifting that 760 kilo quarter barrel, looking a little bit cleaner than yeah. it did uh, when we took it out and lifting that up and swing it into the into the clock frame. If that's the largest component, which is the smallest? What, what is the smallest component on the clock? Well, well, I mean, this one's seven, 760 kilos, perhaps the yeah. largest component in horology in the UK, perhaps the world. But the smallest one, I could say one of the small screws, Catherine, but that would be a bit. <laughs> um, I would say one of the gravity legs or one of the, you know, one of the double three leg yeah. escape wheels. But you know, you're going from that size all the way down. And here we are. This is at the stage yeah. we are now. We've got the uh, dial motion works in, uh, the bevel gears in, and they're running off our 2007 drive unit. We've got the major barrels in, we've got the going train in, we've got the pendulum in, and the clock is ticking, running off one of our auto winders. So, this is where we are at today. There's still a lot of work to do. We've got to put the rest of the trains in, all the linkage, all the automatic winding unit and the weights. But we really are starting to see this 
wonderful machine come back to life, which is which is fantastic. Yeah, it is nice. It's holidays over now in Cumbria, so it's <laughs> back to some hard work for the clock yes. mechanism. And um, hopefully the sound will work on this key, the ticking clock. Um, but if not, everybody will try and post a link of it in some way if we can, because we, we had some technical difficulties earlier. Here we go. It's the heartbeat of the nation ticking away there. Yes. That is definitely a unique sound and uh, yeah, it's amazing to hear that tick again. Good, so that's it, Catherine. That's as far as we can go. You'll have to wait yes. for uh, part two now. <laughs> yes, it's, just, it's hard to imagine that this tick has been in the clock room for over 163 years. And mainly that's due to the clock makers, people like yourself you know, the Cumbria Clock Company and the Palace Clock Team who really take care over this mechanism. And because of your care and careful maintenance, it should carry on ticking for the nation for, you know, future years, which is really a lovely thing, I think. Now, we've come to the end of our presentation and Keith's story. Thank you, Keith, for sharing that with us. And um, we're now going to... Um, try and switch over to your questions to the audience. But before we do, I have a question of my own for you, Keith. Yeah. So if you're up in the clock room and you're standing there with Edmund Becky Dennison, Lord Grimthorpe and the Dents, Edward and Frederick and uh, John Vernon, what would be the conversation? What would you be saying to each other? Firstly, I'll get I'll get um, Edmund Dennison and mm -hmm. uh, the Dent boys to thank John Vernon for saving their clock in 1976-77. Um, that would be the first thing I did. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I'll congratulate um, both of them on building this wonderful machine. It was the smartphone of 1859. It. it it does what it had to do. It shows precise time. Striking that hour one second from yeah. you know, within mm. one second. Um, I think it would be a wonderful conversation to have that we could take on down to the pub later on in the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now, I'm not sure everyone what time we started. I think it was quarter past seven. So I'm going to go through all these questions, Keith, as many as I can and without comment and uh, hopefully we can get through most of them it's quite a lot so thank you everyone for posting your questions and the first one tonight is from John and so his question is so all of the many components which were removed did you have any left over when you reconstructed the mechanism did you have any spare parts <laughs> even a tiny little bolt or a screw no, I, we, I'm, I'm pretty sure we won't have any left over. I think I wouldn't be doing my job properly if we did. I think uh, the, uh, both the Cumbria Clock Company team and the Palace Clock team are pretty confident we won't have any spares. <laughs> Thank you for that. And we've got a question here from David. With the drawings you have, are they drawn as a 3D model and those parts um, shown, are they rendered parts? Yes, the second picture in that section were rendered parts, uh, but we've also drawn them as just old fashioned engineering drawings, which will be more useful in a manual uh, for visual just to, to look at it. But those rendered uh, drawings, which uh, we've done, will be very, very useful, I think, for, for training purposes. Yes. Um, another question from Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. How much wear did you find on the barrel? pivots and what was the worst way you found on the movement? That's a good question. The, the, the pivots on the barrels weren't too badly worn. Um, I think that's mainly because they are so huge and over engineered. The, the worst wear actually was on the rollers for the uh, supporting the hour pipes. I think they were very awkward to get any lubrication into and they take a huge amount of weight and a number of those have become 
badly scored through the grit coming through the centre of the dial into the lubrication. Um, and I think that's an area we've now improved how we can lubricate those in, in future uh, years. But that's where the worst wear were. There are other little bits of wear that we adjusted, but um, the, the it, it's a testament to how well that clock is made that there is hardly any pinion wear on any of the major items. Thank you, Keith. We have a question here from Anonymous. Were there any heart in mouth moments? Anything <laughs> unexpected happen? And you can be honest with us here. We won't tell anyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything unexpected happened? Thankfully not. I don't think there's any heart in mouth. I think with a project like this is more the waking up at two o'clock in the morning wondering how you're going to do something um, and how you're going to get that bit out and how you're going to move something. Um, and you always go back to the, the basic thing that if somebody had done it in the past, you're going to be able to do it. So I think there's lots of conversations between us and the Palace Clock team of how we're going to undertake something, but we always came up with a solution. I think that's not so much a heart and mouth, but kind of a more of an early hour waking up moment, I think. Thank you. Another question here from Kevin. Uh, hello, Keith. Hands Hi. on history, literally and metaphorically, true one truly wondrous it must be a wonderful feeling to know how many millions will be looking up at big ben that's true admiring its magnificence what's next in the pathologue of horology Bray, wow. bravo team ccc so <laughs> they're complimenting <laughs> the cumbria Coal company yeah that's really nice i mean the thing is, this is a wonderful and very prestigious clock mechanism. But throughout the country and throughout the world, there is some fantastic um, clock mechanisms out there spanning so many decades, centuries. Um, so they, they've all got their individual interest. You know, go to Salisbury Cathedral, see a clock from 1386 and even all the way up to the electrical clocks, even some of the mechanisms being made now are remarkable. So there's plenty for us to enjoy, mm -hmm. but this one is obviously a massively special thing for us. Yeah, definitely. I've um, got a lovely question from Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. Have you worked on clock projects in other countries? Yes, I, I, I did a mar marvellous one in Fiji, uh, which combined my enjoyment of rugby and horology. Um, and the people are great out in Fiji. It was a whole experience and that sometimes I'd never believe when I when I was at Birmingham Polytechnic I'd be able to experience uh, some of these things through the world of horology. Yeah. We're working in Hong Kong at the moment and it's the first time I've ever worked on bamboo scaffolding. Wow uh, that's probably for another chat <laughs> for another yeah. presentation. Uh, there's a question here from Simon. How many people worked on the project in total? Well on the clock project I mean, virtually all of the Cumbria Clock Company worked on it. We, I think that's what we liked about the whole thing. Everybody is incredibly proud of it. So we, we try to get everybody involved. Then you got the Palace Clock teams uh, who have worked on, on, on that. The whole, the whole project, you'd have to talk to Sir Robert McAlpine. They, they've run a really good ship and they've had some really good contractors there. And it's been a joy for me to see all this wonderful work being undertaken by these marvellous craftsmen, it, you know, even down to admiring the scaffolders and, and people like that. It's been a fantastic project run on a very, very small footprint. And, and I think people don't realise how hard that must have been to organise. So, yeah, hats off. Thank you for that question, Simon. And I've got another question from Simon. I'm not sure if it's the same Simon, but what was the most complex part of the renovation? I, I think it has to be the, the powered assisted winding system. Um, we've worked on several gravity escapement clocks, so we have a, a rough idea. And I think the size of this one was, was something we had to get used to. But the power assisted automatic winding system, that's a one off and a very clever one off. And just understanding what Dent were thinking of when they designed and built that machine. And, and then you have that moment of realization of wow they were really clever and 
then you fall in love with it and you know it it's still a project i've got to fit it back in we've all got to fit it back into the tower yet mm -hmm. so i might live to regret saying that and i might end up cursing it but at the moment it's it's the most complex part we're dealing with got a question from anonymous oh thank you anonymous they said wonderful talk and great work by all involved and the question is how does this clock project compare with other turret clocks projects that you have been involved with. One assumes it is the biggest and the heaviest, but perhaps in terms of complexity and in terms of complexity and the conditions of the clock. A, a, an excellent question and one which would take a long time to answer. Um, the, the, this again, this is wonderful, but there we have been fortunate to work on some really nice clocks like Hampton Court Palace with its astronomical dial. Um, some of the the the, the uh, um, churches out there which have tune playing machines and carillions and the complexity of making them work down to um, the smallest of just little wrought iron uh, local blacksmith made turret clocks which are unique the one off machines so that you know it's there's so many enjoyable projects that we can do. Uh, thanks, Keith. We've got a message from Anonymous. When working on such an old clock, does your team work in imperial or metric units, i.e. When, when machining or milling components? That's a good, really good question. <laughs> yes. We work in both, I think. Um, yeah, I, 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 it, the, the, the hard thing is, you know, when we're dealing with kind of say clock dials, for instance, they're measured four foot, three foot, two foot, and they just sound right like that. And we start putting those into millimetres, it, it, it just doesn't fit. So um, a, lot of the a lot of the time, above an inch, we work in foot and inches, below an inch, we work in millimetres, but also a lot of the components are, especially the threads, are imperial, and so we have to work imperial. So it's being multi-measurement, I suppose we can say. Uh, from Anonymous, did any of the parts break and have to be re-machined? You can tell us here now. No, <laughs> no. Uh, that would have definitely been a sleepless night if you'd have broken something. <laughs> and will you be writing a book? I've been asked. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, the, uh, I seem to keep busy enough just doing clock repairs and enjoying that to write a book. Perhaps one day when I'm sitting yeah. in my rocking chair. Um, I think that's the last of the questions that we can answer because um, and I'll just check again, Keith, just to make sure. Yeah, I think that is the last. So um, to our audience, thank you so much for listening tonight. And a big thank you to, Keith, to you, Keith, for sharing your story with us. I feel there's going to be a Big Ben part two coming up in a few months time. So because you have so much more of your story to share. Is that is that right? Well, watch this space, I think is the end. <laughs> yeah, so that 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 would be lovely. So um, yeah, big thank you to the audience. If you enjoyed this, we do do a series of talks online uh, about once a month on Big Ben. A little bit more about the history, from the history to construction, to from construction, sorry, to conservation. And we also do virtual tours around the palace as well, if, if you're interested. So please, um, visit Parliament because all that information's there. Don't forget to link up to the feedback survey and the Big Ben newsletter. So I think now all, all it is for me to do is to say thank you to Keith, thank you to the audience and a big thank you as well to the team who work behind the scenes, Thalia, Lindsay and Isabel. Thank you to you too. Um, so, Good night everyone, have a lovely evening and goodbye for now.